Place has sure grown up a lot since I was last down here. Wouldn't you say? Waves everywhere. Last time I was here, somebody put a stick down here. I don't really know. There's water. Might have had to do something with Golden Pond stuff, people that lived up in here. No doubt. Look here. Wow, this place is so dangerous. We got these old wells. Of course, this one's about filled up with detritus and debris, but these things are everywhere down here. All it takes is for a couple of limbs to fall over it, then leaves, and then next thing you know, you're falling down in one of those things. More abandoned clothing. So it's one of the vests. Yeah, another vest. What is this here? Vulcan Materials Company. Well, I don't know. Why well, they would take their vest off down here and leave it.
So we thought we'd do a little exploring. Martin, I sure thank you for that death whistle, brother. I mean the uh, dog whistle, but I'm beginning to lose all faith in it. Guess I just have to keep trying. All right, that's the second item of clothing we found. It's an armadillo. I'm guessing. Down in the ground, eh? They did buy a timber rabbit when I'm down here messing around with the armadillos. All right. Off we go. You guys enjoy the interview coming up with Mark Maycheck. Have a great day. God bless all of you. Thank you for watching the videos. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for stopping by. Really appreciate you being here. We're uh, down here in LBL. Uh, Red Hollow Campground with my longtime brother Mark Maycheck, also a uh, fellow member of the Brotherhood of the Wolf. So, Mark, I finally convinced after 20 years to come a little bit out of the shadows somewhat and tell everyone, share it with everyone, some of the things he knows about this place. There's been a lot of misinformation uh, that's come out of this place from a lot of people. So. Mark can clear that up if anyone can. So, Mark, thanks for thanks for doing this, brother. I sure appreciate it. Tell how long you been down here, LBL. I'd say about about 25 years. I spent a lot of time over here researching. The majority of the time, I, you know, in the early years, I researched over here by myself because I, I guess I didn't know any better. Right. But I had some things happen. It kind of led me in the direction of not researching by myself. So, yeah, I don't blame you there. So, tell us a little bit about like what what was your first uh, what was your first encounter with something or sighting with something unusual down here? Well, that would probably be the night that I was coming over to meet some other researchers that had come up and. Long story short, I had something cross the road in front of me behind them, and if I didn't know better, it, it gave the appearance that it was trying to maybe jump at the back of their truck. Wow. And this thing, I don't know what it was. I've never seen anything like it. 
Um, you know, as far as you know, Bigfoot goes, it was it wasn't a wasn't a Bigfoot. It it was it wasn't anything that I've ever seen before. And uh, what did it look like? It was about the size of a mountain lion, and its head was really out of proportion to the body. It was like super small, but it had eyes kind of like like a sugar glider. You know how sugar mm -hmm. gliders got them real big eyes? Right. And uh, when it was crossing the road, it kind of paused at the edge of the road before it went off into the shoulder. And it turned its head like this and looked, looked at my headlights. And that's when I could see its eyes. It was about the size, roughly the size of a mountain lion. And, but it, it didn't have a tail like a mountain lion. Um, the other thing that was really odd about it was <clears throat> this thing's arms or, or legs, whatever you want to call it, they weren't like a normal animal would be like this. Its arms were out like this. And, um, like spider crawling. Yeah, I mean, it was like, like its arms were out to its side, like in the push-up position. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really, when I saw it, it was moving so fast, I was like, what in the world is that? And, and it, I focused more on the front half of it. And, but its, but its legs were like out to the side. And it was, what was really creepy about it was this thing crawled across the road like a lizard. It was really? like really fast. And it was like doing this, you know how when a lizard's crawling, it's doing this yeah. motion. It was doing that. And it was just, it was creepy. But it paused, turned and looked at me, and then went off on the side, shoulder of the, the road. And I just kept going. If I'd have been going any faster, I would have hit it. Yeah. And I was like, what in the world was that? I don't know, but I'm not stopping to find out. Right. And so I just drove down the road about a quarter of a mile, turned around, and came back, and there was no sign of it. Other thing that was kind of odd about it was its 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 fur was kind of like kind of like a mottled calico kind of pattern, but it had a lot of uh, darker brown mixed in with lighter brown. And then the tips of his hair was kind of like gray, and it just it just didn't look like anything I've ever seen. Um, but yeah, that was the the first thing that I that I that I saw over here that was that was really odd. Um, you know, you hear hear people like uh, Dave Pilatus talk about you know changes in the weather. Uh, affecting the occurrence of strange events and people encountering these things. What was odd about it was when I came to, when I got off from work that night before I came out, when I got to the house, in between the time that I got there and went out to the car, just out of the blue, this real heavy thunderstorm just blew in and then the temperature started dropping and it was like really weird. Didn't last but maybe three or four or five minutes maybe. And then when I, when I was coming over here to the LBL, uh, you know, it, it was clear at that point. Mm. So what it, year was that? That was in probably, uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't know, I would say probably. Probably in the neighborhood of 2007, 2008. Right. Yes. Just a few years after we uh, became friends in 2005. Mm -hmm. So, is that daytime or nighttime? This was at nighttime. Nighttime. So, have you ever seen any uh, dog men down in LBL? Everybody says, "Oh, there's no dog men in LBL," <laughs> and then the other people say, "Oh, yeah, there are." So, what is your opinion on that, based on your personal experience? Well, 
it, it, based off of my experience, you know, I've never seen a quote unquote dog man in the LBL, but I've seen two just on the on the other side of the lakes. So it stands to reason to me that if they're that close, that they would they would be able to you know have access over here. Sure. Um, you know, I've seen two. I have no desire to see any more. Well, tell us about it, man. Tell us about your dog man sightings. Well, um, so it turns out I was walking through a field and I was walking up to check for deer tracks in this area that I was thinking about hunting. And I got up there and there really weren't a lot of deer tracks at that point. And I came came to the edge of the woods and I looked around, I didn't find any tracks. So I turned around and I started coming back down um, through the field. There was like an old runoff, a creek. It wasn't really a creek, it was just where the water had been running off through the field. Right. And um, I got down to almost where I started at and just out of the blue, and I. I don't know how to explain this. A lot of noises around us today. Yeah, very interesting. But anyways, I don't know how to explain this, but I just had this feeling that I was not by my by myself. And I just kind of stopped and I had it. The only thing I had with me was a was a digital camera cuz uh, you know, I was going to take pictures if I found any tracks. And uh <clears throat> you know, dual purpose you know, naturally you're interested in Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. You're out there looking for deer tracks because you're gonna hunt, but you're also keeping keeping your attention or uh, mind open to if you run into any Bigfoot tracks. And this is in a, this place was in an area where there had, had been occurrences in the past. So <clears throat> I got down to where I started and I just got this feeling that I wasn't by myself and I started looking around and, and I just knew that something was was there and I'm standing in the open part of the field and I'm looking up an incline and it's not really like wooded but there are trees but there's sagebrush and everything and there's a few like small bushes well I got to looking up on the in, incline at almost midway of the incline and there's this big bush and Behind this big bush, there was a there was a what I thought I was looking at was a deer. It was just standing behind the bush at first, looking over the top of the bush, and I'm like, "That's weird." So I just was looking at it. And I was like thinking to myself, "I'm gonna take a picture of it." So I reached down, grabbed my camera out of my pocket. And you know, most cameras, when you turn them on, digital cameras, they make that little ding ding. Yeah. Well, as soon as I hit that, this thing turned its head to like this, like it was fixing to move. And when it turned its head, I could see its whole head. And what I was looking at, I don't know how to describe it. It was, it was really, really odd. It was, uh, Excuse us guys, there's other campers down here today, so we might hear some uh, vehicles going by. So, sorry about that, Mark. It looked to me like a cartoony coyote head. Really? And when it turned its head like this, I could see the side, its ears, and the side of its muzzle. And it looked like this thing had taken the best way I can describe it is like some kind of white pigment of some kind and had taken that and put its fingers in it and rubbed it on the side of its muzzle like almost like war paint wow, that's, in, in that's a sense. bizarre. And I think it was doing that you know to, because of the fact that you know when I first saw it I thought it was a deer mm -hmm. because you know most deer when you look at them uh, you know depending upon the time of year most all of them have that white patch yeah. in the, under their neck. So I'm looking at this thing and it pops its head over like this 
And I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh Lord, what in the world is this? And it just bloop, dropped down like to the ground and I was looking for it to pop up somewhere. Well, the next thing I know to the, what would have been to the left side for me, to the left side of the bush, this thing is down on its belly crawling away from that bush. And I know a lot of people have a problem with the whole cloaking theory and not me and all of that. Yeah. But I don't know how this thing was doing this, whether it was some kind of technology, whether it was something natural, whether it was changing its vibration or what exactly was going on. But what I saw was from its feet up to its knee, I watched this go into like a cloaked effect, kind of like this fast. You must have got down here at rush hour today. Yeah, they're moving in. Yeah. So cloaked from its knee to its feet, is that what you said? No, from it, yeah, from its feet to up its leg to its knee. Yeah. As it's crawling away from that bush, and I lost sight of it, and I was like, it's time to get out of here. Mm -hmm. Because if it can cloak, I'm not, I'm not right. dealing with it. You can't. There's no dealing with something you can't see, right? Yeah, that's that's part of the reason why I don't research over here by myself anymore. Yeah, is call on that because I, I had something crossing. Well, cross is not the best way to put it, but I was going down a road. It's a real heavily used road popular road goes to a major camp campground here in the LBL here in the LBL daytime it was three o'clock three thirty in the afternoon and I was coming over to meet some other researchers this was in 2007 as well 2000 no 2007 2008 time period and I was coming over here to camp out with some other researchers and as I'm, I come up to the top of the hill and it goes down this slope. As you're going down the slope, on the right hand side of the road, there's like a ledge that's cut in. So it's elevated above the roadway. Mm -hmm. And on the left hand side of the road, you've got pretty much a clear right of way because there's power lines on that side. And it's pretty much clear until you get to the trees. And that distance from the top of that hill or into that tree line is at least conservatively conservative conservatively I would say in the neighborhood of I don't know 70 80 feet I'm thinking more like 90 feet but this thing whatever it was I'm not saying it was a Bigfoot I'm not saying it was a dog man I'm not saying it was a predator I'm not saying any of that stuff. All I can tell you is what it looked like to me. It looked straight up like out of something out of the Predator movie. And this thing jumped. Cloaked, you mean? Cloaked. It was fully cloaked the whole time. And it jumped off of that ledge into that tree line like it wasn't nothing. Right in that's, front of me as I'm coming yeah, down the road. That's pretty amazing. So basically, it was flying. If it can jump 100 feet, it's pretty much flying, right? Well, How I wouldn't say you, flying, but I would say that it was in, in jump. Yeah, could you tell anything about the size or? As far as size goes, I, I would say probably, I mean, I would say maybe a little bit bigger than a normal man. But mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I would say maybe six six and a half foot tall somewhere in that neighborhood and did you see when it landed did you see where it landed no when it when i went by because it was when it when it was uh right in front of me it was over the roadway mm. and when it hit the trees it was still in the air when it hit the trees that's that's crazy well you know i've had uh, a couple of experiences myself with these cloaked things so uh, I'm not going to get any flack over the cloaking from me because I know it's real. 
I don't know if uh, the dog man can do it as well as the Bigfoot, but I know the Bigfoot can. I don't know so, how they do it, but they can do it. Yeah, right. You know, and, 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 you know, a lot of people don't know my background as far as my research and all that. I was just like, from, from the old days, I was just like everybody else. I was flesh and blood. I was like, you know, it's just an undiscovered primate. I think we all start out that way. Yeah, but you know, through time and experience, my mindset as far as what these things could be has changed drastically, and the things that I've experienced have have propagated that mindset change. Right. So, Mark, tell us a little bit about your background. You're ex-military, uh, right? Yeah was in the military um, you know the way I look at it you know I, kn I know people appreciate people that serve right but I always tell people don't thank me for my service because I might have to be reactivated in some way shape form or fashion with the way everything's going in this right. world right your service might not be over with yet yeah it's, it, it never ends the oath ne never ends right so there's been a lot of people come out saying a bunch of stuff about the uh of course there's got to be an airplane too saying a bunch of stuff about this the uh public stories that's that's generated in, from this place and people they take one story and they add their own little flair and details to it and then eventually it's not the same story anymore and case in point is the bow hunter that was killed down here and i know you've researched this a lot probably know more about it than anyone else can you like kind of clear the air about some of the uh, misconceptions and the uh, I don't know false stories that's coming out here about that well the 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 big thing with that is you know and nothing against anybody you know I, I, right. I, I feel that you know it's good to be be aware of things that are going on and to, to, to spread the knowledge and share different things but when, when you when you don't conduct valid research and you're just telling the story that's where it turns into something other than research right so you it know, turns the, into fiction yeah and the big thing with me and my research is I don't operate like that you know I try to base as much as I can on fact and and documented things that you know come out in the in the in the media people that i know that relate things to me and you know just different different things that substantiate different points mm -hmm. you know when i'm actually investigating a case now the the big thing about the bow hunter is you have to you have to look at it from this perspective you know uh, I guess I guess the 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 biggest thing with the with that case is the fact that you know everybody that's talking about it, everybody, everybody that talks about it, none of those people were here, right? You know, none of them came over here and investigated. At least I never saw any of them, right? You know, and that tells you right there. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm not the kind of person that likes to toot my own horn or anything because, you know, of, of the simple fact that, you know, with this whole research thing, uh, I don't think that, that people really understand what they're getting into when they start actually researching. Because, you know, telling a story is one thing, but actually getting out there and, interacting with people and trying to trying to get them to share information with you that's a totally different thing right and you you ask the wrong stuff to the wrong person that could be problematic for you exactly so what according to your research which is the research that I trust above anyone else anyone out there talking about this bow hunter Whenever someone asks me about the bow hunter and his death, uh, I always 
say that's Mark Maytag's story to tell. So tell us what happened to this guy in reality and not fiction. So the 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 short the short condensed version is basically um, and, and I one thing that I want everybody to understand about this this particular case is you know I don't generally talk about this right and the reason why is because this was a real person this was somebody's loved one and out of respect for that 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 person I've never really gone public with any of the the research that I have you know compiled any of the documentation or any of that stuff the name I, I yeah. assume that you know the name of yeah, the, I, I the know real who, name I know who he was you know, so, I, I don't know him personally, but I do know who he was. My wife, Letitia, is over there filming, and Mark's wife, Linda, is over here looking for Ron. So, baby, don't let anything sneak up on us, okay? Right now I'm hearing uh, walnuts and stuff falling, but don't let a Bigfoot get us, okay? I'll try. All right. I'm going <laughs> to jump up and kill it with one of my knives or whatever, sword. Okay. All right, go ahead, brother. Tell us about the bow hunter. What happened? So, um, long story short, the condensed version. Basically, there was a gentleman that came over here to hunt, to pre-scout before the hunt. What year? This was in 2007. So, he came over here, and when he left home, he told his family that he would be back Monday. So he was gonna camp all weekend and come back Monday morning. So, Monday morning rolled around, and he never re returned home. So his family got worried, and the original story that came out in the in the news related that they didn't really know who to contact at first because of the fact that this is federal land. So they contacted the state police, and they contacted in turn the, the park the park uh, rangers at that point. So what I was what they related in the news was that. They looked for him, and they eventually found his campsite. They found his vehicle, but there was no sign of him. So they looked around a small small area, and and they were looking for different things, you know, to try to locate him. So they said, well, maybe he went off into the woods and got into an accident or he's injured or something like that. So they sent out a call for uh, search and rescue. So search and rescue from three different counties came in and they conducted a search. Well, they searched and searched and searched and, and they could not find him. They searched for uh, the rest of Monday night Tuesday, Wednesday, they searched half of the day. They called the search off at midday because of, there was some bad weather coming in. So they called off the search. Well, according to the news media, that weekend there was a state trooper and uh, one of the local county coroner's offices that had cadaver dogs they brought over and they conducted just a two person, two canine search. And they located his body and um, in the news there was never any clues or indication as to, you know, cause of death, condition. The only thing that was released was that they were sending his uh, remains for an autopsy and uh, Initially, that was the the end of the story at that point for for me, mm -hmm. for for a little bit. Now, I wanted to come over and investigate, but I didn't want to come over and you know interfere in what was going yeah, on. Yeah, interfere in in anything that could have been going on, because <clears throat> what they were what they were relating in the in the news media did not to me it didn't sound right. So, uh, you know, a person is, unless they're hunting, they're not going to go a mile, mile and a half away from their campsite to 
you know, yeah, to just you know die unless they had an accident while they were hunting. Right. So, kind of had my suspicions up. So I was like, I want to go over, but I don't want to interfere if there's people still over there processing <coughs> or whatever. So I waited. I waited a week, and I came over. And um, I drove into the area, not knowing exactly where the campsite was, but when I drove into that particular area, I was kind of, I was kind of met with the location of the campsite because there were several vehicles pulled into that area, uh, along with uh, two big white suburbans. And as soon as I saw them. You know, based off of the, the news media releases, I knew that that was probably where he was camped at. So, seeing seeing all that activity, I didn't want to interfere in any way. So I just got out onto the trace, and I went up to the next road that on the west side of the trace, and went down it. So, when I got down there, I was. I was like, <laughs> I was like, man, I gotta go to the bathroom. I gotta pee. So I pulled down in there into a location that's known as as a as a as an area that has high activity for bald eagles. Mm -hmm. So I pulled down into that location and I got out of the vehicle and I walked around the side of it. You know, you don't want in case somebody pulls in, right. you don't want them seeing you peeing or whatever. So I was trying to be discreet about it. Well, when I got done, they had just combined the field on the left-hand side of the road. So I, I had a wide open uh, area of view from where I was at to the other side of the field, which is probably in the neighborhood of about 550 yards. I think the last time that I measured it on Google Maps. I think that field is 550 yards wide. And on the far side of it, I noticed that there were, when they went in and combined, that they had left like several rows of corn still standing on the just the outside edge of the, of the woods. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that I noticed was it looked like initially like there was a root ball of a tree, like a tree had just fell over and the root ball was elevated up in the air that was sticking out into those corn those corn rows. And I was like, ah, they left that corn there because they didn't want to interfere with that tree that fell over or whatever. Well, I got to looking at it and I was like, you know what that reminds me of? Remember that cartoon, the Magilla Gorilla mm -hmm. or Grape Ape or whatever? Yeah. It's kind of what it looked like. I was looking at it and I was standing there, and the more I looked at it, I was like, no, nah, there's no way that's anything. So I walked around and uh, got back in the vehicle, and I sat there and I looked at it again. And just in my mind, I was like, man, that really, the more I look at it, the more it looks like a big gorilla down on, it's like this. Yeah. And I was like, that is so freaky. But I was like, there's no way that's not a uh, tree root ball. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I'm not going to waste any more time with it. So I got in the vehicle, I started the vehicle up, and I drove up the road a little bit, a little piece, and up a hill. I went to the top of the hill, and I turned around. And when I came back down, the first thing I noticed was there was a, a young lady and a little boy. They pulled up in a, in a, in a, Ford pickup and uh, she was out of the vehicle and she was picking him up and putting him in the back of the bed of the truck well you know seeing them I was like well this is just, you know the first thing that I noticed when I was coming back down the hill the other thing that I noticed was I looked out across that field and that root ball was gone there was no root ball there was nothing so I don't I'm not saying that that was a Bigfoot but if it was a Bigfoot, the odds of it being out in the you know middle of the day in almost the wide open where somebody could see it 
there had to be something wrong with it. Either it was it was old and what or wasn't able to hunt, or had been kicked out of its its group or whatever. I don't know. But the other thing that's kind of interesting about it is the fact that that location was about a mile and a quarter from where the bow hunter was camped at. So I'm not saying that. How far away was it from where they found his body? You know, I never have actually measured that, but from the campsite, it was about a, a mile and a quarter. That's interesting. So I'm not saying that the that whatever that was, if it was a Bigfoot, I'm not saying that, it, that a Bigfoot did that to mm -hmm. that guy, but if you look at it from the perspective of, you know, dealing with no, any normal wild animal, you know, if you have an animal that's, you know, known to be nocturnal and it's out during the daytime and it's not acting normal, then there's something wrong. Right. So, you know, there is a possibility that there could have been something wrong with that. And it if might it, have been responsible for the two guys Death, right? So it could be. How did you find out about the condition of the body? Let's hear a little bit about that. Do you know anything about that? You know, I've heard people say this and that. And the I mean, other. I've heard a lot of things about that. Was you it know, predated that, on? Was it not? Yeah, I've heard all kinds of things. You know, even, <coughs> even, uh, you know, the, the news media never put anything out about that. You know, you think about it, if you have somebody that's been deceased in the woods for almost a full week, yeah. you know, there's going to be you know, coyote predation or whatever. Right. You would think that. You know, I never, I've never heard anything about any condition of, of, of this gentleman's body, um, anything like that. Well, I've heard all kinds of stuff that's, it's back on his clothes folded in a neat pile uh, nearby and all kinds of just made up stuff that, you know, to, to sensationalize something, but now that's the uh there was actually two bow hunters killed down here right well i'm not quite done with that first story. Oh, okay well let's continue on with that so we have we have that that is the the news media version of that story mm -hmm. that is what was publicly released everything that i experienced that day and all, and all of that now if you move to the to the end of the month Closer to Halloween, um, they used to have these. They would put on these tours, and they would uh, basically take groups around to different locations here in the LBL. Mm -hmm. You know, after sundown, right? And you know, it was kind of a Hall Halloween kind of thing, and they would tell stories and you know about you know different things that supposedly happened, ghost stories and stuff like that. That's kind of weird. So, it it turns out that uh, uh, our 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 old friend Jan Thompson contacted me and was like, "Hey, you know, I'm thinking about going to this. Um, have you heard about it?" I was like, "No, I haven't, but let me do some checking. And I'll see see you know what their their whole agenda is mm -hmm. and what they're going to do." So it turns out I I went to it. She went to it as well. So, <clears throat> uh, interestingly, when I got there that evening, uh, there was, it, it was myself and Jan that showed up early, and two of the Forest Service employees came out as soon as they got off work and they were talking to us. And I was just kind of like an innocent bystander there in the conversation. I didn't really know anything or whatever. And I was just listening to them talk. Because, you know, um, I'm kind of <laughs> kind of unique when it comes to, you know, talking to people that I don't know. Right. Um, yeah, you just don't do it, do you? No. It's too peopley out there. Right. <laughs> Meet people. So, uh, they're talking. And we get to talking about, now, before the bow hunter incident, there was a, a young guy that uh, had uh, brought harm to himself. 
and uh, was camped at the Energy Lake campground and uh, they found him deceased and they were talking about that and uh, there was a male and a female uh, Forest Service employee and the, the male employee asked Jan said well did you hear about the other one and she was like yeah and I'm thinking what are you talking about you know so she's like well whatever happened with that and he starts relating basically the incident of what was reported in the news with regard to the whole bow hunter incident he never said that it was the bow hunter but he did say that the guy had been camping and they found his truck mm -hmm. and they said that when they found his campsite that when they rolled in there initially that <coughs> it looked like somebody had taken a baseball bat and he beat his truck from one end to the other, busted every window out of it. So he's he's relating this stuff, and I'm like, this is this is weird, you know. Mm -hmm. and then he's relating, you know, the whole thing about they started looking for him and they couldn't find him, and they called in the search. They looked for him till Wednesday, and then uh, Friday or Saturday they brought in the cadaver dogs, and. They located his remains in a clearing a mile and a half south of his south southeast of his campsite. So the next thing that he said, which was kind of weird, was that when they found him in the middle of he said he, when they when they found him, he was in the middle of the clearing and said he was butt naked did not have not a stitch of clothes on but it looked like something or somebody had ripped all of his clothes off of him and had strewn them around the outside edge of the clearing in the treetops really this is what the storyteller said the LBL storyteller right the LBL uh, employee right now did that really happen? I don't know. I wasn't there. All I have is what this this guy was saying. So, and that's pretty much all that was really said about it. Once, once, uh, once he uh, related that, Jan was like, "Well, hey," and he was like, "Well, what's your name?" You know, and she introduced herself to him. And said, "Oh, and this is my friend Mark. He's a he's a local Bigfoot researcher." And when she said that, that killed all the conversation. The dude just had this look on his face, like, "Oh my gosh, I've just messed up," mm -hmm. and uh, maybe said something he shouldn't have. Now, I don't know whether what he was telling me was true or not. You know, I I didn't see any of this stuff firsthand, right. so well, definitely interesting. A lot of stories come out of here. A lot of stories. Lots of stories. Um, a lot of people have. A lot of people have seen a lot of things here. You know, we've been coming here for 15 years, and my wife and I have never seen anything until the last time we were here. And she saw uh, her and her group saw that thing flying up out of the field. So there's no telling what all's in this park, especially after dark. Do you know of any caves or anything around here? Have you ever seen any caves? There, there. As far as I know, there there are a few small caves. You hear rumors of larger caves. You know, as far as them being mapped, you're not going to pull up a map and be able to say, "Hey, this is where yeah. a cave is." Now, you know, this area used to be uh, real rich in uh, pig pig iron production back in the 1800s and there was a lot of iron ore mining and you know there are some iron mines you know mm -hmm. ore mines here that you can still find on some older maps you got to know you got to really know what you're doing when you're when you're digging into that kind of stuff because they're not on new maps mm -hmm. 
Well, I've heard of a couple of caves here, but I've never, I never got to see any of them so far yet. I would like to, and maybe one day I will. Yeah, I would, I would not be surprised in the least if there are caves over in, uh, in here. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people don't know. Uh, a lot of people have heard about this shofar blowing, and a lot of people don't know that the first time it was ever blown in connection to searching for cryptids, which is a terrible word, in humanoids, uh, was right here in the LBL. Is that right? A lot of people don't know that it was you that's been doing all this research on this shofar for all these years, and there's been a lot of uh, talk about it. So anything you want to clear up about that subject while we're sitting here talking? Well, as far as where it was actually first used, you know, when I when I uh, brought that research, n not the the complete research, but parts of that research to that researcher friend of mine, uh, to you know, because I got in, in, you know, with any kind of research, you know, if you're if you're trying to. Uh, find something that works for a particular purpose or whatever um, it doesn't do the research justice if you can't test it right right and the only way to you know validate it is is to test it so long story short I shared that knowledge with uh, a well-known researcher who I've been friends with for a long time and uh, you know, as, as far as where it was actually first used, I, I don't really know where the first location was. But that is kind of not really a a concerning point, right? You know, the concerning point is that you know everybody keeps asking the same questions about it. And they seem to be enthralled with the, the concept that it works and, and uh, you know, I mean, granted, there are, there are folks that do want to know the inner workings of it, but the only thing that re really people need to be concerned with is that, yes, it works, and my recommendation is not to use it. Right because of the things that I've learned in my research. Right. Well, it's known as the voice of God. I guess we come down here to the, it's like a Walmart parking lot now. <laughs> but yeah, it's the voice of God and it's the only venerated uh, yeah. musical instrument in and the world. All the uh, rest of the instruments, except for this one, they all belong to Satan. All belong to Satan, yes. And not the shofar. The shofar is the only one that doesn't. So there's a big religious significance that goes along with this musical instrument that people don't know. You know they, you, the last thing we need is a hundred people out blowing shofars in the woods of, across the country. We only need one, much yeah. less a hundred or ten. So, and you know, after I after I learned that it was not a good thing to do that. You know, naturally, my the first person I called was my researcher friend, and told him, said, "Hey, you need to you need to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, because you, you, you're you're going to end up in a bad situation, and you know there are some serious uh, spiritual implications that go right. along with it. You know, and he related that he was going to was going to stop. You know, until you know we were able to figure out." more about it which you know I mean the the more about it is you know pretty much you know it's kind of a I mean yes yeah, it's, it's good it's it's not necessary information to know just know that it's it's not good to do it right now, your researcher friend, he did not stop blowing it, though, did he? Or did he? And did he suffer any negative consequences for doing so? I don't, I, I don't know that. Um, 
you know, I mean, um, the only thing I could do was, uh, relate the, you know, the, the importance of the <coughs> significance of not doing it mm -hmm. and advising them not to use it. And, you know, it's like anybody, you know, you can, you can tell somebody don't drive 90 miles an hour. All right. But if they decide they're going to get behind the wheel and drive 90 miles an hour, you know, I mean, you did what you could do to try to prevent them from doing it, but, you know, a, a sort of handcuffing them somewhere to a, to a stop sign or something to keep them from getting in the vehicle. But right. at the end of the day, if they want to drive 90 miles an hour, they're going to do it. So your advice is don't blow the shofar and do a little research yourself to find out why you should not do that, right? Now, let me clarify something. Do not utilize, my opinion is, that you should not utilize the shofar to call in humanoids. Now, if you're doing it for the right reasons, uh, part of a relig religious ceremony, or whatever you know your particular religious beliefs might be, knock yourself out. But to utilize it, and, and trust me, um, you know if you're doing it for the right reasons and the right way, you're not going to have issues with cryptids. All right, but if you're using the voice of God to call in demonic creatures, then there's going to be a problem, right? Pretty simple, right? Yeah, it's pretty simple. I mean, the Word of God tells you not to do it. Don't do it, you know. And that's good enough for me. That's all I need to know, so you won't be seeing me out here or anywhere else blowing on the shofar horn. All right, brother, thanks for coming down here and meeting me here. Hey, no problem. Sharing what you know, you put up a lot of uh, misperceptions about the things that happen around this place and, you know people talk and talk and not everything they say is true and we're just trying to get to the truth that's all we want and it doesn't have to be sensational or we just want the truth whatever it is so is there anything else you want to share with, with everybody before we close this up yeah the main thing I wanted to share is you know stories are fine stories are, are stories but when you the listener hears the story it's up to you to determine you know what level of truth is in that story and you don't get that from just hearing the story right so I would encourage people to you know if you're if you're going to somebody's channel and you're looking for valid information valid true information then two things you can do is you can go after you hear a story you can do everything in your power that you can to try to validate the information in that story the other thing that you can do is you can demand as a viewer you can demand that the person that's telling these stories tell you the truth and you know, I mean, nothing against anybody that tells stories, but it, it's really, it's really making it difficult for people that are trying to do research and right. trying to do valid research. Right. And that's why, you know, for the last 25 years, I've, you know, just been in the background doing my research, doing my thing and not really you know, publicly sharing a whole lot of it because of the, of the fact that, you know, the, the trend always seemed to be gravitate, you know, the trend seemed to be that people would gravitate towards the sensational stuff, sensational stories that aren't valid information. And, right. you know, I just, I don't want to be associated with that, that kind of thing because that's not what I, what I'm about. I'm, I'm not a podcaster. I'm not a storyteller. Um, and you know nothing against people that that are podcasters and storytellers. I mean they have a they have a uh, an integral role in our society. But <clears throat> when it comes to research and trying to you know 
try different things, you know, as far as experimentation and, you know, trying to validate information. Vent the witnesses. Yeah, and, uh, sure. you know, one, one thing that I'm looking at is, you know, we have a, the trend seems to be, at least as far as I'm seeing, where we're having a lot of crossover from people that are that are podcasters and storytellers, where they're wanting to become researchers, mm-hmm. and you know, the the big difference in being a researcher and being a podcaster is, and, and I think this is where people get messed up is they don't have that freedom to go in and and you know sensationalize a story where. A, you know, they could as a podcaster, but as a researcher, you have to document fact and present that as, you know, part of your research. And so one thing I've been looking at is, you know, if people want to want to become researchers, then, you know, it's, it's up to some of us people that have been doing this for a long time to show them the right way. Right. So one thing I've been thinking about is, you know, doing some things to show people the right way. Well, that's good, brother. I mean, that's all we can do is stand and be be true and be honest. And, uh, you know, like I say, we want the truth that no matter what it is, whether it's mundane or sensational, we want the truth. That's what we're we're focusing on here at this channel, especially. I know other channels are too, so we just have to keep keep striving for that mark, and maybe one day we'll everyone will hit that mark, and we'll all have a bunch of actual real knowledge instead of a bunch of fiction. But thanks, brother. Hey. Sure appreciate you coming here, and thanks for keeping it real Thank for everybody. Thank you. All right, guys. Keep it real. Keep it real. We'll see you next time. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks, guys. Make it.